Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less. I'm your host, Ray Harkins. I, I like sing the intros now. I think it's kind of funny. I'm your host, Ray Harkins. Anyways, on the show today is a very infamous figure within the independent music scene. His name is Mike Cheese. He's the vocalist for a band called Gehenna. And, uh, you know, for some of you, you may have no idea who he is or no idea who Gehenna is. But let me tell you, our conversation is fucking awesome. Listen to it. Your mind will be blown. This is the true definition of a person who loves music. So, anyways, more on him in a minute. Propertyofzack.com. They are a spectacular website. Music is dissected, talked about, reported on, etc., etc. If you are a fan of any subgenre of music, besides metal, they kind of don't touch on that. Everything else, they cover. So go check it out. We love our partnership with them. Visit there multiple times a day, propertyofzack.com. Now, for some of you who've listened to a lot of episodes, just bear with me. This is stuff that I have on a script, and I really just like to get it out there because not everybody listens to every episode. So anyways, with that being said, go to the website, 100wordspodcast.com. I try to post fun stuff online that I see throughout the course of the week. And uh, yeah, that way you can kind of interact with the show when it's obviously not in your ear holes. It could be in your eye holes. And then uh, go review the show. Go to iTunes, type 100 words in the search box, pops up. You can give it a few stars. You can write a few sentences on it. And I really appreciate it. So I've, I've gotten some recent feedback from the states where it's like, hey, bring in some more people that are prominent within the Orange County hardcore scene. And I was like, okay, I will. I'll get to that. Don't worry. Don't worry. And I appreciate the suggestions because I love when people email and say, hey, you should have this person on. Not only does it show that they are interested in the show, but that they have a vested interest in hearing more of it. So that's awesome. And uh, for those of you, my last name is Harkins with an S, H-A-R-K-I-N-S. I've been noticing a lot of emails, you know, Ray Harkin, and it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just getting more uh, aware of when people mispronounce my name or misspell my name. Anyways, Harkins, not like it's a big deal, but there it is. Let's see. I want to talk about something before we got into the interview. Recently, there's been a lot of stuff that's been published online in regards to kind of, you know, the way that the sort of tabloid culture bleeds into the independent music scene. It seems to be that obviously any drama that happens, and when I say drama, like, you know, a band member quitting, you know, someone getting arrested, uh, whatever, there's that obvious inherent interest in like, oh, wow, I wonder what happened. I wonder what the real story is. Um, but just, I always try to take myself sort of out of that, like, oh my God, that morbid curiosity. Of course I'm curious. Of course I look, and of course I stay tuned to whatever is happening in an ongoing drama-filled saga. I just, I become concerned when it's like the most talked about things online or the most covered things online in regards to a lot of the news sites that I check out uh, are those stories. It's like, you know, what about this great editorial piece on this amazing record or whatever and i understand there's a lot less dramatics involved and we as humans are drawn towards drama especially if we're not involved in it take a minute to breathe when you see a story published or whatever you know don't maybe post the comment that you think about right away um you know let it breathe for a minute because i don't want you to be a troll it sucks to be that person who's like oh man fuck that guy or worst dude ever or whatever uh, there's obviously a lot more worse things that could be said, but um, yeah, let a story breathe, pay attention to it, but you know, don't, don't dive into the conversation immediately until you've kind of, you know, maybe put yourself in that other person's shoes. So anyways, it's just been something that's been bothering me lately. So Mike Cheese, like I said, he's the vocalist for a band called Gehenna, who's been around for quite some time where I met him at the record store I used to work at. You know, we, we talked about this in the interview, but his reputation preceded him. And I was kind of intimidated by him going into it where it's like, oh, you'll be working with Mike Cheese. I'm like, oh, shit. Honestly, within like, I'd say 20 minutes of me working my first shift with him, totally got a great vibe of him and from him. And he was really, honestly, instrumental in introducing me to a lot of bands, 
you know, knowing the way kind of things were before I started to go to shows. And he was just, you know, a great resource. And at the end of the day, I'd like to call him a friend and a good dude. Yeah, he talks a lot about what he has done in order to create the music that he enjoys and not so much... Ne- Never from a career perspective, but just like, I have to do this because it is in my blood. Here's our conversation with Mike, and I will talk to you afterwards. You know, it's like right. usually you're, you know, you're fucking busy. Shit's happening. Like that just doesn't happen. So it's fun for because for a person like you who I've known for a long ass time, there are certain things where I'm just like, you know, where were you born? I have no idea where you were born, Mike. Really? No idea. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, ser- I, I, no, uh, I, was, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. OK. I did not know that. Yeah, I was born in Detroit, Michigan in uh, 1973, lived there till 1988. That's when my folks decided that they wanted to move to the uh, West Coast. Uh-huh. And uh, so we moved to San Diego. Uh, my folks moved back to Detroit when I was about 16. And uh, I decided that it was probably a good idea that I uh, stayed on the West Coast because I hate shoveling snow. People that come from Detroit obviously have a large sense of pride about that city, or they fucking hate it for many, many different reasons. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a little... Uh, a little interesting you say that because it's not exactly the truth. I think everyone from Detroit mm-hmm. loves Detroit and hates Detroit. Okay. <laughs> There's no like, oh, they either love it or hate it. No, they love it and hate it. Like, Got it. Everyone loves Detroit and everyone hates Detroit. And it's, and it's a really simple thing. It's like, I'm going to be a fan of like, all oh, the teams from Detroit forever. But, you know, at the same point in time, like, I, I genuinely, truly, and completely hate the idea of shoveling snow in a city that, you know, has trapped people and underpaid workers and, you know, survives off of slave labor, basically. Right. You know, and, and, and I mean, uh, the, the city is just kind of, it's brutal. It's, I mean, you know, it was, it was once like the, the strongest manufacturing city in the Western world. Yep. And then it just fell apart and disintegrated super easily because the corporations figured that they can go ahead and survive by... But basically, by you know, kind of fucking people. Over, you know? Right. There's no repercussions. Like they could keep exploiting that city, and that would never run out. And then once it did, they were like, "Okay, we'll just move on." Right. Exactly. And so, what did your what did your parents do there? Because obviously, like jobs were, you know, I mean, at that time they were well, still happening. But what, what did your parents do? Well, it's it's hard to believe, but my dad worked for the automotive industry. <laughs> um, yeah. No, my, my dad worked for the automotive industry. Uh, my mom was a teacher, an elementary school teacher. Okay. That's where I kind of got it. Like, you know, my, my dad was like a plant security guard while he was going to college, mm-hmm. got his degree in engineering. And then, you know, from there, like, uh, just he, he was a chief engineer for uh, Chrysler. Oh, wow. Uh, he worked for General Motors, worked for Ford. He worked for all the big three, um, just consulting and stuff. But, like, you know, we'd all just, like, kind of sat down at dinner one day and, my dad was like, uh, yeah, I'm not shoveling snow anymore. We're fucking moving. And that's when we moved to San Diego. It was really that abrupt. Really? I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm a lot like my old man. You know, impulsive decisions that change your life immediately. Right. You know, that's, that's, that's what I am, you know. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a product. You're the same way. You know, you're yep. a product of the people that, you know, raise you and, and the environment that you're raised around. And the only way you really change is once you figure out, you know, a way to change your environment and change the way you're going to learn and grow and, you know, observe things. Yeah, so, no, definitely. And so, do, and did you have any brothers or sisters or were you the only child? No, I, I got a brother. Uh, I got a brother. He's three years older than me. He's about four inches taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> and his shoulders And his shoulders are about eight inches wider than me so that means he wears like a 52 jacket <laughs> and uh and he's about six four six five he's a really really good size dude yeah yeah and that, that was that was where i learned to uh defend myself at an early age ah so he yeah. he, he was the one that gave you the tactics to uh utilize 
throughout your life. Yeah, yeah. Growing up in Detroit, growing up in Detroit with my brother it was pretty interesting. I mean, I lived in Highland Park, and Highland Park, dominantly uh, black neighborhood, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't even know what it was like to encounter other Caucasian kids besides my brother until, you know, later in life when my dad got his degree and we moved from Highland Park into like Warren. I would say it's a, a, a blue collar, like great, like middle class suburb, a lot of working families, definitely tons of different ethnicities, all just kind of piled in. And it's and it's really a great culturally diverse like neighborhood. It's just, it's really, really chill. And that was like the first time I really encountered other kids besides black kids, you know, and I was maybe nine years old, 10 years old, something like that. But, right. you know, growing up in Detroit, it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And my brother's a pretty, he's a big dude. And, uh, you know, how it is with older brothers and yeah. younger brothers, you, you, you learn how to take a punch or give a punch pretty quick so that that way you can <laughs> save yourself from losing teeth or right, whatever. Right. Total, you know? an- total annihilation. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so the uh, so the move out to San Diego. Basically, your dad, like you said, just sat down at the dinner tables, like, "All right, we're fucking out of here." Were you stoked? It, it was a little bit different because, like, the culture shock of it initially was really strange. I mean, California and Michigan are, are two totally different worlds, and at that time in 1988, even more so. I mean, it was there was no internet. There was no. People are cool everywhere, and, and people weren't, you know, catching on to what the hip trends in, in fashionable cities were then. It was just kind of like you were in a really bizarre working class, uh, a blue-collar city like Detroit, and then going from there to a, a city like San Diego that is pretty much it's a military-industrial complex town where everyone's paid on sunshine dollars, <laughs> it kind of goes to the beach every day, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was a huge culture shock. It was like, it, it was it was insane, you know? Like, I couldn't figure it out. Um, but eventually, I think my ability to get along with people, to avoid confrontation by being twice as confrontational, if that makes any sense, uh, I, think, I think that led to me really enjoying the West Coast. And so when I was 16 and my folks were like, we can't make any money out here, we got to move back to Detroit where we could actually generate some real capital and like pay for, you know, the things we need as we get older, gave them a hug and kiss and said, I love you guys. Have fun. And they moved back. I stayed in San Diego. That was that. I'm sure by that time you started to kind of become aware of music and you were involved in that sort of subculture. So like, did your parents, <laughs> did you have that relationship with your parents where they were like, we don't know what the fuck to do with Mike. So I guess we'll just leave him out here. Cause he really wants to stay here. No, no, they, they, they told me I could figure it out and I, I went out and I, I mean I had a job I've, I've worked a job since I, I like I've never I've never not had a job or a scam and it's always been either a job or a scam it's always been some way to like grind and make some money or some way to take some money from somebody that's making it you know what I mean it's like I've always figured out a way earn what I needed to to take care of what I needed and get what I want and I've never had a problem with that you know I, I mean I was seven years old with a paper wrap. You know, I, I was the first kid I knew that was, you know, building traps to fucking collect change uh, from, like, you know, vending machines. <laughs> I was, like, I was the, the only guy that looked at fountains, decided, like, well, there's probably, you know, good $55 in there. All I got to do is show up with a fucking net and pretend I'm cleaning it and go home with it. You know, I was dressed like a valet standing outside of a hotel, driving off with cars, taking everything that was in it, and then leaving the car and <laughs> walking away. <laughs> right, you know? right. I didn't have anything to, to strip the car. I was a fucking idiot kid, you know? Right. So uh, what, what am I going to steal a car and have no place to put it? Right. I was smart enough to realize that that doesn't make sense. All you got to do is get it around the corner and take all the luggage out of it and go through, pull all the things that people carry that are of value take off you know and it's like right, right. It's, it's total shitty stuff that like idiots do but you know i'm also the the same kid that was like oh smoke detectors are small they cost 38 dollars each i'm gonna walk in grab you know 15 smoke detectors go to the you know building supply store and return them and you know get 
cash money back for it. You know, it's like, or, you know, taking things off the shelf, walking straight to the counter and returning it. But I mean, those were all things that I did because out of necessity, a 16 year old kid right. that's alone, uh, uh, an alien land has to figure out a way to survive. And so, you know, I've, I've always figured out ways to make money and do what I had to do. You know, it wasn't always the best thing to do, but I mean, I made it this far. <laughs> right. Well, no, you've always. When, I mean, when I first met you, like that's that that became very evident very quickly that you know you were you know for lack of a better term, it's like you know you, you're a hustler, and like that's and yeah. I don't and I mean that in the most positive way possible because like all you're trying to do is figure out a way where it's just like yeah, I like to do the shit I like to do, but you know I'm not interested in in you know participating in corporate life or whatever. So it's like, oh, I'll figure this out some other way. Right. Well, when, when you first met me, I was working, what, three jobs? You were working at the distributor. You were working at Bionic. And then I don't remember where the third one was. And I was working at security at uh, Chain Reaction. And I was working uh, door shifts at fucking, um, at, at uh, Paul's and shit. Uh, oh, sh- in Orange. Oh, like, oh, yeah. Whatever, like any, any, any stupid nitwit dollar I could make, I was out doing it. And like, you know. People were kind of like, oh, what are you doing? I'm going to work, you know, and, and I was buying and flipping records. I mean, I was, I was buying and flipping records before eBay existed. Yeah, you And were. people thought, like, I was, I was full of shit. And I was like, no, really, I don't know. I don't know much about this, but I know what I like, and I know what people are looking for, and I've seen what's on the wall in other record stores. Because I've always been a record fiend, you know? I've been a music nut. And, like, you can go into thrift stores all throughout, like, Encinitas or Escondido and pull out stuff that old folks were just getting rid of that, you know, they didn't care. And the thrift store guys didn't really know what was up then. So they priced stuff out at a buck. You buy it for a buck. You drive up to some weird collector's spot like Mr. C's and you're selling, you know, a Beatles butcher cover for $60, $80 and you paid a dollar for it. And it's like this thing that kind of goes in cycles. And then all of a sudden you find out that they're flipping them for two or three hundred and they're going, Oh, well, cool. I'll just go ahead and buy an issue of a of a trade paper like Gold Mine or whatever and all of a sudden you're in this world of bizarre record collector geeks that are looking for, you know, stuff like Pink Freud. Right. You know, or, or so you know, things with misspellings, you know what I'm saying? Like like things not Pink Floyd, Pink Freud, you know, like it's a misspelling. It's a blah blah blah. Or, or they're looking for super bizarre pressings of things, things that don't even make sense, you know, like things that you only saw existed in your dreams, you know, like, uh, like misstamped, you know, pressings of like Slayer's Criminally Insane Remix 12 inch, you know, it was a UK pressing, but there was a handful of them of the UK pressings that had like a label that was actually pressed into the grooves of the vinyl <laughs> rather than on the center label. And all of a sudden there's people that want it. I'm like, you can't even play it. Yeah, this is like, stupid. It doesn't make sense. Right, right. What do you want that for? <laughs> you can't even play it. It doesn't even make sense. Who wants that? You yeah. know, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I know who wants that. Yeah. Some fucking bizarre collector geek that needs to have everything. Some completist that wants the whole collection. And that's great, you know. I mean, because of that, you know, I was able to figure out right, what right. I liked, what I knew about, and what other people liked and knew about. And I was able to find a lot of interesting, great records for a lot of people and make a lot of money from it. <sighs> Two things about that that I'd like to extrapolate on. Well, I mean, one, like when did sort of independent music kind of come a part of your life? Because obviously anybody that does some simple research knows that, you know, you know, you really started to, you know, take a part of the San Diego hardcore scene and obviously hung out with all the dudes in Unbroken and that's kind of when sort of Gehenna started to, you know, be a thing. Prior to that, when was your sort of intro point to independent music? In Detroit and stuff, when I was still really young, I was still like absolutely nuts about it. And um W A H S was a radio station, is Avondale High School radio station. And they had, there was a kid that had this punk show on, you know, that, that station, and, and it blew my mind. Uh, the first time I ever listened to it, I remember sitting there thinking, like, holy shit, this isn't like Black Sabbath or Judas Priest, which I'd loved since I was in, like, fourth and fifth grade. This isn't like the, the hard rock from WLLZ, from that radio station that was nuts. This isn't the stuff that, like, I would cut lawns and deliver papers and, you know, do damn near anything for this this is like stuff i didn't 
see in record stores. I hadn't seen when I would go to Harmony House. I, I couldn't even understand where you would find this stuff. It was just blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. And then there was this moment where I met this kid, you know, in Harmony House Records on Woodward Avenue. Uh, and, and I met this kid, and I was talking to him. He was like, yeah, I have a radio show on WAHS. And I said, hey, man, you know, I, I'm freaking out going nuts like talking to this kid and, and like telling him like I, I'm listening to your show and he's like no that's not my show and and I was just kind of confused I was like wait there's there's other shows on there that are like this he's like oh yeah there's so much different stuff like that guy just plays you know punk you know whatever and, and I play you know thrash metal and I was like wait what? what what's that and then here I am 11 or 12 year old kid that's all of a sudden being introduced to all these weird, bizarre spots in the record store, kids don't go to. Kids, kids aren't even like supposed to stand there because you know if like dudes from the Apple Sids walk in, they're just gonna stomp your fucking head into the ground and take whatever money you have in your pocket and buy whatever record they want right there in the middle of the store because they don't give a fuck. They they could give a shit if you live or die, you know. And, and I mean that right. was like the really weird part was that I I realized there was so much other stuff out there than just this one show and so I started listening to this other kid's show and that just blew my mind and, and got me hooked and I, I must have been like I don't know like I said 11 years old something like that 9, 10, 11 by the time I moved to Detroit or moved from Detroit to San Diego when I was 14 I was already just obsessed with records and tapes and anything I could get my hands on it. and it wasn't you know stuff that was on large labels there was a lot of stuff on independent labels you know, local independent labels from Detroit, you know, and, and, and weird stuff that it wasn't from Detroit, but it was bands that were from Detroit. And it was this insane, like, love affair with these records that people looked at me like I was from fucking Jupiter when I talked about, you know. And and, and that, that was the one thing that always struck me, like, when I was working with you at Bionic, I was definitely aware of your presence <laughs> before I started working with you. And then the so thing handsome, that totally... Right? Oh, yeah. I was just like, my God, he's so attractive. I can't wait to hit on him. I, I thought um, you were quite beautiful, too, right? <laughs> well, thank you. It really did. Like, honestly, working at that record store really opened up my own mind to the fact that it's like, okay, I can like things outside of, you know, snap cases, snap case, strife, earth crisis, or whatever. Like, and I saw, like, you were a living, breathing proof of that, where it's just like, okay, here's this guy who sings for, you know, the infamous Gehenna, who's like, okay, he's probably into, like, you know, trash can black metal. And like, that's it. And then the fact you could rap with like hardcore kid and, you know, uh, uh, an old jazz dude can come in and you can talk to him. It just, uh, you know, it, honestly, it inspired me where it's just like, oh, yeah, like music is this ever changing beast and you shouldn't shut yourself off to certain shit just because, you know, it doesn't appeal to your scene or whatever. Right. Well, you know, and I think a lot of that has to do with more, more or less just understanding cultural diversity that, that's out there in, in the world. I mean, you know, do you only want to eat hamburgers every day? Or do you only want to eat pizza every day? Well, the answer, of course, is yes, because you only want right. to eat every day. You don't want to eat the same thing. If you only want to eat pizza every day, that makes sense. Will you go to the same pizza place every single day for every meal? Absolutely not. But you can only eat pizza. After a while, your body's going to reject that, and you're not going to be able to digest you know, wheat or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, you're going to have the thing where your system just can't take it anymore. And you're going to look for something else to nourish yourself. And so you're going to go for something different, like a piece of fruit. And that's kind of really right. what the same thing is with music. You know, like you, you'll, you'll get hooked on weird stuff. And, and obviously punk was a huge thing for me. And, and when, when I first moved to San Diego, I remember seeing kids and not being afraid to just walk up to them and say, Hey, man, I'm Mike. What record stores do you go to? Hey, do you skate? Let's go skateboarding. Let's go talk about, you <laughs> right. know, and people look at me like I was a fucking alien because they were like, you're not supposed to talk to me. You're supposed to hang out with like the dirt heads and metalhead dudes. Obviously, you've got a fucking suicidal tendencies t-shirt and you've got shitty long hair. You're riding a fucking skateboard. This doesn't even make sense. This is like, you know, like you, you listen to that, you know, I, you know, crossover record way too many times. Like crossover doesn't really exist, man. There's no punk or metal friends. That shit doesn't exist anywhere. You know, like, get the fuck away from me. I've got a cramps t-shirt on. You can't talk to me. You know, and, and, then, right. and then that's when, like, I just kind of realized, I was like, uh, 
I don't think I'm ever going to like fit into anything besides what I like anyways. So I'm just going to go buy records and enjoy myself and skateboard and hang out with like-minded folks. And, you know, obviously there's some people that you bump into that you realize want something more than just pizza every day. God, man, I feel terrible making that analogy because I do love pizza. Your point is well taken. Like I said, I'm really glad that I had that experience when I was like, you know, 19 years old. I so remember this. I, I, I remember listening, like, you know, that that was when Dashboard Confessional was like, you know, blowing up. Dashboard Confessional, everybody's like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And I remember you being like, you know, because you always put me on the spot and I loved it where you were like, you, do you like this Dashboard Confessional? And I was like, yeah, it's pretty cool. And you're like, have you heard Nick Drake before? And I'm like, no. And then, you know, you put the record on and it's like, oh, I see what what that actually is. You know, I, I think everybody should have that little push of encouragement to be like, hey, like, you know, look backwards, like realize where this stuff came from, because ultimately that'll just give you a better context. And like you said, you know, a better appreciation of music in general. So, yeah, well, you know, and I, I think I think something that's happened in recent years, I, I would say, is the kids with the Internet and all that kind of stuff, kids can do that. But what's gotten really bad is that with the chat rooms, message boards, all that kind of stuff, and all those sort of communities online, people have gotten into a, a really weird, almost worse thing than being, you know, close-minded about the music they've listened to. Now they're looking for that next shit all the time, that next thing. And, and it's like, I get it, you know, you always want something new and exciting and diverse with music. You want to be challenged. You want to learn from it. You want to laugh. You want to talk. You want to dance. You want to feel sick. You want to you just want to feel something when you listen to music. And I think the craziest thing I've noticed now is that people don't feel anything. They just feel whatever a publicist hands them and tells them is good. You know, like when the publicist says, this is good. This band is good. This label is good. When they hear it said to them through media channels and a publicist now, they believe it immediately because the internet buzz and generated hype confuses people into believing everything is good as long as it has certain people behind it to say it's good rather than actually saying hey you might like this and your friend might bring a record over might tape something for you or make a mixtape for you and you hear something and you go I'm, I'm not supposed to like that and then you listen to it and go oh yeah that is kind of rad people don't even listen to it now now everybody is just like reading the 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 posted comments about it. People are checking out, you know, how many views it has or how many people have got behind it. And, and it's all generated in, in false hype because a lot of times views that bands have are set up by their publicist or PR agent. Right. And uh, this is, this is where, this is where things are going to get interesting. And I'm probably not going to have anybody want to book a show for me ever again, <laughs> but uh, it's done so that that way promoters who say, how many tickets is that band worth, can actually say, oh, okay, well, let's generate some hype regarding this, and then that way people will come out and buy tickets for the show, and we'll blah, 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 and, and it's, it's this weird cycle that kind of goes around and makes money for people that work for corporations, and they really don't understand art or passion or love or anything like that. They really just look at, you know, numbers yeah it's just it's just and, data and it, right exactly it's data exactly you know i mean I, you know we're all guilty of that to some degree of course do i go out and, and tell people like hey man blah 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 you know you're gonna love my band yeah I, I tell people that all the time but will they love my band probably not right like, i mean <laughs> i don't think i've i don't think i've made a record that anyone would love besides myself so i mean me and dean and nikki have been making these records for 20 years and not one of them has been made for anyone else but ourselves anyway. So right. why would I sit there and do that? It's simple because I got that kind of work ethic. Yeah. Where capitalism's ingrained in me. <laughs> <laughs> like I was alluding to earlier in regards to, you know, your reputation preceding you where it was like, cause obviously anybody that does simple research online can see pretty quickly where it's just like, my well, it, 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 it is a known fact. I am a good dancer. Yes. Uh, and it, you are, you, you, are, are you, you do break dance and I've seen yeah. it. No. <laughs> when, when the hits start moving, you know, you open it up. The, yeah. I mean, 
No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to no. cut you off. No, no, you're fine. Calls. You're fine. You're doing fine. People view you, and, and obviously the reputation has died down to where it's not as, like, you know, Mike Cheese is a fucking threat to the independent music community, but <laughs> not like it ever was maybe that high to begin with but the you know the fact that it was like there was there was an idea that you were uh you know a very confrontational person and you know you fought everybody and whatever in your own mind what was the funniest shit you've heard about yourself that actually got back to you that you were like oh that's incredible i wish that was true oh oh man wow that's 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 a tough one i mean you know there, there's you know i'll, I'll say this right there's, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes around, and I, I think a lot of it's died down because when people meet me, they actually go, wait, what the fuck? This dude's just really funny. This is strange. Like, he's funny, and he doesn't really take shit. Like, he doesn't mind, like, arguing or, or, or laughing and talking, and, like, this guy will split any meal in half with you if, if you're his friend, you know? This guy will give you his shoes to walk to the store if you need them and give you money to buy something if, if you need it. A lot of people like realize that I'm not like a horrible person. I just happen to be uh, a, a very outspoken person. The other thing too is that you know I had these, I, I got you know, <laughs> I've got these nicknames, you know, stand out. So people don't remember you know what Ted Smith did. People always remember oh this one time there's this guy his name was like Mike Cheese this guy <laughs> fucking dude apocalypse this guy. Okay so this dude was like the skateboard guy. Right. That broke both his ankles so many times he didn't skate anymore, but like went to hip hop shit and like collected like funk records and like you know was like the worst bowler I'd ever seen, but wanted to be on a bowling team because he heard they had the best chili fries in the city at this bowling alley. You know what I mean? Like they, they just say weird shit that's always something bizarre because really kind of true. Like I don't I don't give a fuck. Like I, I just kind of do whatever I'm doing and enjoy it. And people's lives are boring, so they talk. They talk about people that are interesting. And I guess I'm kind of interesting because I don't live in a corporate box or, or do, like, the, the scheduled things I'm supposed to do or listen to what I'm supposed to or eat what I'm supposed to or anything like that. It's strange, but, you know, when you hear something, like someone say, this dude I know told me that this girl she knows was, like, hanging out with this cat and they were bullshitting and all of a sudden, Mike runs up, pulls a spoon out of his hand while he's eating ice cream, and stabs him with it. <laughs> you know, and when people say stuff like that, I'm like, wait, what? You yeah. know? And there's, and, there's, and there's even somebody that told me that I stabbed someone with a, with a frozen hot dog. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, and the funniest part of the story is that it's sort of true, but not really. I didn't stab a guy with a frozen hot dog. I definitely had a pack of hot dogs in a bag it was frozen and this dude was like acting a fool and I just you know took my grocery bag and kind of clunked him on the back of the head with the right with 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 a pack of frozen hot dogs and it knocked the motherfucker out but it's it's a frozen pack of hot dogs that knock anybody out <laughs> right you know I mean it's like getting hit with a fucking with a rock that's in a sock you know what I mean and they're like you know and then there's all this crazy shit but it's like you know if it, if it's me getting you know robbed or beat up or somebody getting hit with my frozen hot dogs, I'm going to hit him with my frozen hot dogs, you know? Right, right. No, I, 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 yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, I lived on the fucking street for a minute, you know? Like, I, I figured it out, you know? But, like, when someone says that I stabbed someone with a frozen hot dog, it's really kind of funny. Yeah. It's actually, you know, to me, that's, that's actually even even better than the truth, you know? And I wish it was true, you know? Like, I mean, can you imagine, you know, fashioning a, a, a prison shiv out of a frozen hot dog. Yeah, there's so much talent. So much talent in yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing, right? Like, oh, I heard you stab the dude with a frozen hot dog. What? Yeah. That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. No, but, you know, I've heard a lot of funny shit, man. Yeah. All, all, of it, all of it's funny to me, though. Like, And I, and I kind of like it because... Obviously, the fact that, I mean, you said any nickname person is going to be talked about just because they'd be like, why the fuck does he have a nickname like that? He must be doing some fucked up shit. Um, and then, two, the fact that you keep people on their toes in the sense of, like, you yourself, like, are an extremely nice individual. Like, you know, if someone talks to you, they're, you, know, you may look unapproachable just by your looks because it's like, oh, who the fuck is that weird dude with long hair and wearing a flannel, whatever. But once you actually speak to them, it's like, oh, yeah, like, they're actually nice. 
and right. it, it like that throws people off. Like you know, right. if you, if well, you, you know, it's it's a, a good example is like a guy like you know, like John Brandon. There's a guy that everyone has some story about him shooting dope with piss water and you know <laughs> stealing the band's van so that he could sell it for heroin and then knifing somebody and like this, that, and the other. And I don't know if you've ever met him, but he's a guy that had some rough times and you know went through some horrible bouts with addiction and shit but he's genuinely one of the coolest nicest sweetest fucking guys you'll ever meet right you know but his name john brennan it's like one of those names you kind of remember and also he's associated with the greatest band to ever play music negative approach you know uh, or like you know john joseph from you know the chromax i mean john joseph is like that, that's a guy that you know you hear these wild crazy stories about and you bump into John Joseph and you are meeting this really well articulating, uh, just interesting, funny, sweet guy that would climb a fly. You know, he, he genuinely has the best interest of everything around him, you know, in, in, in sight because of his own personal life and, and the things that he wants to experience, you know, and it's, and it's really strange that, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to John Joseph or, right. or Brandon or anything. I'm saying, those, those are two examples of, of folks that have unique names that are memorable and they happen to be outspoken and interesting personalities. So people make up weird, wild, insane stories about them, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, e it's easier to do that than it actually is to, you know, get to know someone. <laughs> right. Totally. Totally. Exactly. I mean, like Black Dahlia, you know, people make up all kinds of wild stories about Black, you know? Yeah. Black's fucking boring. You know what Black does? Black chases around my ex girlfriend. You know? Yeah. That's what Black does. You know? Black 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 wants what he what, what what he can't have, you know? Right. We all want what we can't have though, right? No. I, I mean Black's just a human being. He's a he's a he's a nice guy. You hear stories about Black and you think the worst thing ever, and this is a guy that's like, oh, I'll have a diet cook, please. A nice dude. You know, but people make up these wild stories about him because, you know, it's it's easy. Yeah. Oh no, for sure. And obviously, with the musical output that you know you are so closely attached to with Gehenna, I mean that's the band that you obviously have that has lasted the longest and has been you know the the most uh, yeah the most active in your life. Um, I remember there was definitely one time where I saw you. Uh, I you played the showcase theater with, and I can't. I want to say and we talk. I can't remember, but it was definitely after I'd met you. Um, it was early, so early 2000s, maybe. Uh, I can definitely empathize with you in regards to the, you know, like when you play, you kind of get into, not kind of, you definitely get into a whole mental state of performing, you know, and not like performing like a, you know, like a circus clown or anything like that. But I just remember seeing you walk to the stage. Like, I, I, I remember you walked by me and I just looked at you and it was like, w we made eye contact, but there was no like recognition. You were just ready to play. Like, do you, do you find yourself getting like, you know, out of body experiences, like when you play and stuff like that? Or is it, you know, yeah, you're I mean, fully I, aware I mean, of what you're doing? I, I write stuff that I want to hear and I play music that I want to hear, but more than anything, it's like a, a very intense cathartic experience for me because, you know, it's about love and death and drugs and fighting. And I mean, not like fighting, like, like, yo, I'm gonna fight this motherfucker, but about fighting, like, like, you know, living... <laughs> in the back of a car for a month, you know, living in a car. Fuck, I got a car at least, you know, don't got anywhere to drive it, don't got anywhere to, right. to park it, don't got any gas for it, but I have a car and I got a key for it and I can unlock it and I live in this thing and this is my life and I eat garbage. And when I'm saying eat garbage, I'm talking about day-old bread that's thrown out or day-old scones or whatever thrown out from coffee shops and that's where I live, and that's what I eat. So is, is, is my music about, like, pain and suffering and anguish? Yeah. Is it about joy and happiness? Yeah, totally, because it feels fucking good to have an apartment. You know? It feels good to eat something that's not out of the trash, that is healthy for you, that's going to make your life more, more tolerable. And, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, with Gehenna, with Sangral, with MFTS, with, with Witch Lord, with, with every one of the bands, with Discreet Doll Band, with every one of the bands that has been connected to Gehenna, 
uh, penetration panthers. Uh, you know, every one of us, like we've we've all played in each other's incarnation or each other's band, whether it was Devil or you know Gravehill or, or any of it. We always had this idea to make music we wanted to hear, so we'd make a new band and form a new band and play new music. And it's always been this insane, like experience to play live, where it's it's really intense. I mean, and I'm not gonna say that it's for everyone. I don't think everyone should see us play live. Right. Would would I would I want my parents to see right. me like that? No, but I never like crying in front of my mom either. I don't. I don't. You know. I mean, I'm serious. Like right. I, I can't. It, it yeah. hurts so fucking bad to see my mom upset or whatever that you know. I wouldn't want to, I would want to be strong for it, you know? So, you know, it, it's like, I, I don't want some people to, to see me go through like one of the most emotionally intense moments of my life. And I put myself out there and do it. And it's, it's not fun. It's not pretty, you know, it's not pretty to say, you know, I love you and I can't have you. Uh, it's not pretty to say I, I've wronged you and you're the most important person in my life. It's not fun to say, you know, I can't believe you're supposed to be someone that I love and respect and you would do this to me. It's not easy to say like, Hey, I don't fucking need anyone. I don't need society. I don't need a job. I don't need anything. Cause I've got this car and that's where I live. You know, it's not, it's not easy to say that kind of stuff right. to, to go through the pain and frustration. And, and so there's, there's a lot in it. And it's even hard to talk about sometimes. Cause you know, I want to just say things like, like, yeah, man, you know, I just kind of feeling shit and like, you know, I just does it, you know, like really, I don't just does it. I yeah. just, I can't help it. It's like, it's a, the same reason that I do what I do 20 years later, you know, in 1993, when, you know, somebody said to me like, Hey, we're going to this fucking party. We're going to play the show and fucking, we got all this gear. Let's go do this. And I looked at, you know, my friends and said, yeah, that'd be fucking rad. And the next thing I know, you know, we're in a bedroom rehearsing and recording stuff. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. And next thing I know, I'm, you know, living in a different state, you know, avoiding incarceration, writing and recording another record and like going on tour, making phone calls and, and trading records with folks so that that way, you know, we can get shows and I'm pressing a record and I'm, distributing a record when there was no distributors and like, you know, taking the right, business right. model of not knowing how to do any product, any, anything that has to do with business and just, you know, my business model is like, Hey, we're homies. We could sort this out. You, you're, you're my friend. I could send you these records and you could sell them in your town at shows, or you could sell them at your local record shop. And then, you know, maybe that'll work out. And maybe, you know, we could play in a basement and maybe we could tell people to give us a dollar per person as they come in and maybe they'll buy some records and maybe I'll still live in a car, but at least I'll live in a car with my friends and be able to like exercise these demons that are running through my head that fuck me up. Right. Well, and I think to what you're saying right there, I mean, I think there's always been an element of, um, you know, outsider art. There's obviously an idea of, OK, you know, you're starting a band. I mean, obviously, in the early to mid 90s, there was definitely no context of like, OK, I'm going to start an independent punk or hardcore band and we're going to become like what Green Day is today. Like that just didn't exist. But the idea of like creating art for art's sake and then be, and then even going further than that and being like okay well we know that we are going to appeal to like you said a very small portion of people that are going to these type of shows we are literally creating something for ourselves so when we are putting it out there this is like out of a sheer act of desperation because there's no other thing that we know how to do besides create this type of stuff and like you said it it obviously puts you in a position where it's just like well we're not successful financially, but we at least feel honest about our approach to what we're creating, you know? Right, you know, and, and, and the thing is, too, is there's so many folks that, you know, they, they form bands with the intention of pleasing other people, and that's fine. I mean, you know, there has to be jingles to sell Coca-Cola. I'm cool with it. I don't care. I mean, I got good friends that are career musicians. I'm not talking about guys that, like, make... $80 a night playing jazz. I'm talking about, like, my old boy Dan, like, you know, this motherfucker's got platinum records and shit. You know what I'm talking about? This, this dude's got, like, that kind of money. 
You know what I'm saying? Right. And he comes and kicks it with me at the bar I work at like once a week, and we bullshit about all kinds of stuff and talk about food and places to eat, and we talk about being on tour and going to these fucking bizarre spots and, and you know, I don't know, hot dogs or sashimi or, <laughs> or whatever, you know right. what I mean? And this is like a dude that his whole thing was like, I'm going to make music in my bedroom in Redwood City, and when somebody rolls up and says they want to do something, I'm going to look at it, think about it, and go, yeah, that sounds good. And then all of a sudden, the music he was making kind of was working commercially for him, and he signed this great record deal. Little did he know, this great record deal was going to keep him trapped. And he was trapped for almost a decade, you know, where he was just scrambling to make it, just doing anything he could, you know, just really doing anything he could to, to make money to pay his rent. Then all of a sudden, you know, he uh, he says, you know what, I really want to do a record with that dude from fucking Ultramagnetic MCs, and fucking, that would be the weirdest, fucked up his record ever. I'm going to do this thing. He does the Dr. Octagon record, right? And then what happens? The world changes. Right. <laughs> Everything in the world changes. Sure. And it's not like because he intentionally made a record that was going to sell and then draw him on to make, you know, the Gorillaz records and all those records like that. Dan had no intention to do those. He had the intention to make records that he wanted to listen to. And all of a sudden, people listened to him and they freaked out. And now here's a guy that is business minded about all his stuff because he's like, wait, are you kidding? Like I've made multi millions of dollars for your bullshit corporation. And, you know, and I'm like scrambling, struggling, DJing like fucking weird parties and shit to make ends meet. Like, no, fuck that. Like I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and handle the business myself and get the right people involved run this thing in a different way, you know, and, and he and I talked about it a lot, you know, that my idea of music and his idea of music are two different things, but we both agree that it's got to be passionate and you got to have your heart in it or it's worthless. And, you know, so here's a guy that is at the, the, the absolute height of his game and respected more than anything, talking to a dude that's still 20 years doing anything he can to, like, not go crazy and put a gun in his mouth. You know what I'm saying? I like, yeah. like, I mean, music is a really weird thing, and, and you got to do it because you love it. I mean, art is a weird thing, you know? I mean, you just got to you, you gotta make it because it's, it's in you because you're passionate about it, and if you're not doing it because you love it, if you're just doing it for something else, it's going to be really transparent, you know? I mean, yeah. the guys from Green Bay, it, like, they, they made music because they loved it, and then all of a sudden, they bumped into the right person that said, hey, we think this punk thing is going to explode. And they looked at them and said, yeah, I like the sex pistols. And that was the comment that had, you know, this label go, oh, my God, we found the sex pistols. You know, and then they realized that they found a marketable band that was making music that people can enjoy. And they yeah. marketed it and sold it and people enjoyed it. Right. Bizarre the way that works, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's so, it's so weird. It seems like so simple, but then you're just like, oh no, there's so many fucking steps in between that. Right. Well, well um, I mean, a lot of um, the biggest step between making art for art's sake and having something that's a sellable product, the biggest step is is being able to understand that when you're making this some people are going to scoff at something you're very passionate about and something that, that, you know, means the world to you. And that's kind of like, I think with the Gehenna records, everything we make takes almost a year to two years to come out. I mean, like e even longer sometimes. I mean, Negotium took two years. It was recorded and finished and we sat around listening to it by ourselves, you know, riding around in friends' cars, listening to it on different car stereos, deciding whether or not we really liked it enough to release it. And it was like, it was nuts, you know? I, I think the same thing with the public radio. I think it was two years between the record being made and it being released. And, you know, with the new record now, I mean, labels have deadlines, but, you know, the only deadlines I have are my own, you know? I mean, so any label that wants to put this record out can keep telling me when they have to have it for the deadline. But, you know, I got like a body of work to go sell. You know, I could go out on the road and sell records 
till the fucking cows come home. Cause I got, you know, we put in 20 years of releasing records on our own time. I mean, I'm not going to go ahead and rush to meet deadlines right now just so that that way it can meet a tour schedule. You know, I don't, right. I, don't I don't care about meeting the tour schedule with deadlines because that's just, it's insane. You know, like, why, well, you've never, I, you've never, you've never operated that way. So why all of a sudden would you change the, what you feel comfortable with? Right. And, and the other thing too, is that it's like, you know, why, why do I really care if someone's, making money off me or not i mean people are going to make money off me till the till the day i die right i mean i'm going to be a worker and go into whatever factory that i work at and punch in and generate a product or a service so that that way this company can make money and grow and they can live in good houses and eat while i just clock in and pay my rent and I've done that my whole life, and that's all I know. So why now would I say, you know, hey, let me really hurry up and double time it for you, boss? You know, right. like, <laughs> like, yes, sir. I will get right on that, boss. No, I'm not doing right. that. Like, I don't, I don't do that. Like, I think no. so if, if, if the new record, you know, some kid said, you know, hey, how soon is the new record coming out? And I was like, I don't know. Probably when I get done listening to it. After I listen to it three or four hundred times and I decide I like it, it'll come out. You know, I mean, Dean has to listen to it three or four hundred times.